so thank you for organizing this uh, beautiful event and for inviting me in, in Ljubljana. My objective here will be very modest. I will simply try to interpret the chapter six, the beginning of the chapter six of the phenomenology of spirit, the beginning of the section spirit. And I will emphasize the importance of the conflict between men and women in this text. In particular, I will explain that the beginning of the section spirit exposes on a social and historical level the dialectic of consciousness of chapter four and displaces the experience of the denial of recognition onto the field of gender conflict. I am pursuing two objectives here. First, I want to show that gender relations are central to the way the phenomenology of spirit analyzes history. Then I try to weave a link between the chapter on the master-slave dialectic and the chapter on the Greek world in order to understand the conflict between the sexes as a conflict of recognition. In my conclusion, I will point out the potential of this interpretation for a feminist reading of Hegel. The introduction of chapter six of the Phenomenology of Spirit marks the beginning of history in the monumental odyssey that leads consciousness from sensible certainty to absolute knowledge. If all the figures of consciousness previously studied remained abstract, it is because consciousness was analyzed for itself independently of its inscription in a particular historical world. This is no longer the case for the spirit section. Strictly speaking, it is only here that spirit enters the scene of history, insofar as Hegel defines it as ethical actuality, that is, as a consciousness that is not isolated and abstract, but as collective reason in the world. The point of view of consciousness is overcome and inscribed in the political and social institutions of the historical world. The so chapter six inscribes singular consciousness into the concrete totality that constitutes the world and that the chapter five announced as belonging to the realm of ethical life. This is this historical world that now stands for consciousness as its true substance. Uh, yes. Hegel no longer focuses on the individual, but on the figure of the people. And this is the difficult articulation of the point of view of individual consciousness with the perspective of the people and the social totality that will guide the course of the figures in the spirit section. Chapter six opens with the conflict faced by consciousness in the Greek world at the beginning of Greek history. Thank you. The beginning of the section spirit presents a first form of experience. In this case, this is the experience of the ancient Greek city. Drawing on the work of this period, especially Sophocles, Hegel offers a description that is more of a conceptual reconstruction than a careful historical study. According to him, Greek society is part of an ethical world, the Zitlische Welt within which the freedom of human beings is objectified in a set of rules and institutions that organize the living together of individuals. The Greek ethical world is based on the articulation of two laws, a human law and a divine law. Human law refers to political law consciously developed by individuals in order to govern the existence of community. The spirit is therefore the polity, I use the Pinkard translation, the polity that gemein reason, both the common essence that creates the unity of the people and the effective set of citizens in the city who live together under common law. Therefore, the institutions that carry human law is the power of state, Staatsmacht, or government, Regierung. Insofar as it refers to the conscious and deliberate activity of legislation. Divine law for its part, also organizes the community with rules, but it is the natural community of the family institutions, 
it refers to what Hegel calls a natural ethical polity, a naturalicious, zitlicious Gemeinwesen. This moment is the family, said Hegel. The rules in question are therefore no longer the political laws elaborated in broad daylight and in full consciousness. They are the rules of kinship that structure what Hegel calls immediate and natural ethical being. However, Hegel points out that the natural bonds of kinship are seized in the social uh, and cultural order to receive a proper ethical meaning. The family only becomes a social institution through this cultural appropriation of blood ties. Hegel considers the death of the individual and the subsequent funeral to be decisive moments in this process of the spiritual elaboration of naturalness, in which the bond of nature become, become conscious and are appropriated by the spirit. Hegel's idea is that the family only becomes a true social community a line of kinships that transcends singular natural existences to become a spiritual community when it overcomes death by giving it a properly cultural meaning, in particular through the tributes paid to the dead. This is why the family institutions is the place of divine law. That is the law of religion. Religion um, as it is responsible for paying tribute to the dead. We are here in the private family sphere and in the realm of the dead, far from the public space of political deliberation among the living. This also means that we are at the level on kinship ties, which have a natural origin and which for this reason do not originate from the free self-conscious will of human law. It is absolutely essential that Hegel, in order to describe in detail the functioning of divine law, and the institution of the family is particularly interested in the relations between men and women because it is these relations that will prove decisive not only in order to grasp, um, to grasp the articulation between human law and divine law, but also in order to understand the crisis that will arise and that will call into question this harmonious articulation. He outlines the three relationships in which women are seized or stuck in the divine law. Relationships of uh, wives and husband, of a daughter and fathers, and sister and brothers. And he understands these relationships with the concept of recognition, anerkennung or anerkannsein. In the introduction, uh, this use of the concept of recognition should not be surprising. In the introduction to chapter four of the Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel had indicated when he was about to present the pure concept of recognition and its misdirection into the dialectic of domination, that in the reciprocal recognition of consciousness, the spirit already emerged. This is the famous, the I that is we and the we that is I. It will not be surprising either that in chapter six, because we are at the, in the beginning of the chapter six, because we are at the beginning of the section spirit, the recognition between men and women takes an incomplete and insufficient form and leads to what Hegel himself calls an oppressive situation. The feminine, according to Hegel, is suppressed, but Pinkard translates uh, the word unterdrückt. Uh, the feminine is unterdrückt uh, in uh, Hegel's text. And Hegel deals with a struggle, ein Kampf. Hegel explains that the relationship of man and wife is initially the immediate self-cognition of one consciousness in another and the cognizance of reciprocal recognition. Um, in German, this is das Erkennen des gegenseitigen Anerkanntsein. But Hegel immediately points out that this recognition between husband and wife is still too rooted in the naturalness of blood ties and desire to achieve a satisfactory relationship between the sexes. It is only through the child they carry and raise, and not for themselves, that women seem to gain recognition from their husband in the Greek city. This is why the relationship between husband and wife is more about natural desire and reproduction than about effective ethical recognition. Recognition between parents and children 
also remains tinged with naturalness. Hegel described it as, I quote Hegel, the emotion broken by their awareness that they have their actuality in another. And Hegel indicates the limit of this immediate and natural attachment. This emotion certainly binds the family member together in a form of natural affectivity, which seems to be due that children feel that they owe their life to their parents, and conversely, the parents see in their children an extension of themselves. Nevertheless, it prevents the attainment of a true spiritual recognition in which individuals are recognized in the full sense of the word. In this case, it is no longer sexual desire with a view to reproductions that endures recognition between men and women, but a form of natural and primal love, not yet spiritualized, a love that is too immediate to achieve the reciprocal mediation of consciousness. The feeling of being naturally moved, says Hegel, binds parents and children, but it is too close to naturalness or even to animality without consciousness to be considered a true form of ethical recognition. According to the requirement of the pure concept of recognition, the accomplished recognition would imply, on the side of the recognizing being, an activity of the intelligence in addition to affectivity, and on the side of the recognized being, a recognition of its freedom and rationality. However, this pure, con this pure concept of recognition can only be realized within a historically ethical life that determines it and gives it concrete effectiveness. We know that for Hegel, the Greek conception of freedom did not make room for individuality and for what the principles of philosophy of right will call the right of individuals to their particularity, which is specific to modern civil society. It was essential in their relationship to the universal as citizens who participate in political life and obey the law of the city that the Greek lived their freedom. This doesn't mean that the Greeks had no awareness of their particular individuality, but it wasn't made effective through the institution of ethical life and could only arise in the mode of crisis or anomaly, as the figures of Socrates or Antigone prove it. The feminine figure of Antigone is exemplary here, and this is precisely the reason why Hegel will give her such an importance in this chapter 6 of the Phenomenology. Greek women were indeed deprived of the freedom proper to um, the Greek men and did not participate in public life outside the household. This particular status explains why the emotional recognition they found in their families as married women or as girls remains insufficient. The recognition of women is not really institutionalized in the affection that a father has for his daughter, and in marriage it is essentially through the child that the wife uh, is conceived. Hegel notes, however, that Greek women had a form of prescience of a true recognition through the singular relationship between brother and sister. It is only as a sister in a relationship with the brother that a Greek woman manages to have a sense of the accomplished recognition. In this relationship, neither the sexual desire between spouses nor the natural attachment that binds parents and children is involved. And this is why this is a place where a true recognition can happen. Hegel says that the feminine as a sister ends as the highest intimation anung of ethical essence. Nevertheless, there is a significant inequality between brother and sister, which deprives the woman of effective recognition. Indeed, once he has reached the age of majority, the brother has access to political life and participate in the elaboration of human law, and, but the sister remains enclosed in the private family sphere and doesn't seem to have access to citizenship. The sister can never access the space of citizenship in which she could step outside the natural relationships of the family and claim her right to ethical recognition. She remains locked in bonds that are still too natural to achieve full spiritual recognition. This is why no more than the mother or the daughter 
the sister cannot find herself recognized. Hegel says the sister is deprived of the moment of knowing herself as this self in the other. The dissymmetrical relationship between men and women that Hegel describes allows him to thematize at first the articulation of divine and human laws. Women give birth to male children who are raised in the family and then they leave the family to participate in the political community. Men, of course, are destined to die one day, possibly prematurely in war, and then they return to the divine law at the time of the funeral provided by the family. The divine law must be seen as the foundation from which the human law can emerge. And conversely, the human law is the ultimate raison d'être for the existence of the divine law and returns to its beginning at the moment of death. The complementarity of human law and divine law is based on a sexual division of tasks between men and women, between the public and political sphere and the private family sphere, which ensures the beautiful harmony of the society. Hegel describes a complete cycle in which each sex plays its role in ensuring the coherent functioning of the social order. This beautiful harmony is broken by women's negative experience of this asymmetric and unequal organization of a society that is based on the denial of their recognition. The following of chapter six is no longer concerned with the basic principles of the society, but with the concrete experience of individuals when it comes to actually acting and confronting the principles with reality. This experience reveals the contradiction um, in the articulation of human and divine laws and leads to the decline of this mode of social organization. Hegel insists, on one hand, on the emergence of individual consciousness, which had not appeared at the level of the pure description of the two laws, but which emerged in the experience of the action actually undertaken. It is in particular with the help of Sophocles and Tigone that Hegel exposes the questioning of the functioning of the two laws by experience. Sophocles' tragedy reveals the contradictory nature of the two laws and their opposition which can arise in a concrete situation. In this case, when Antigone has to fulfill the divine law by burying Polynesis, and human law dictated by Cleon has formally pro prohibited it. Some commentators have seen Antigone as a kind of a puppet of divine law, an emissary of funeral duty who at no time brings her free will into play and who identifies absolutely with her function. But no pragmatist readings, Pippin or Pinkard, have made clear that Hegel is very explicit that the consciousness that reveals the contradiction of the two laws does not simply implement a collision of duties, but decides for one of the laws and invests the duty it chooses with its particular will. It is certainly true that Antigone defends her family and the religious tributes against the political decision of the government. But for all that she appropriates the divine law, she chooses in all conscience and assumes for herself the law that she invests and that she claims against an opposing law. Hegel insists on the conscious and free but tragic character of Sophocles' heroine who acts knowingly and acknowledges her fault and yet makes the decision to defy the law of the city. The result is a conflict in which the consciousness that has been offended takes revenge, rare, on the opposing law. It is with pain that Antigone receives Creon iniquitous decision to refuse to bury Polynices and to condemn to death anyone who defies his ban. In Sophocles' play, not only does she defy her uncle prohibition, but she claims her action, repeats the prohibited gesture, and is arrested. A girl repeatedly emphasizes the vocabulary of offense, injured consciousness, revenge, and struggle. And with a link with the chapter four, in which the struggle to the death follows the denial of recognition because the consciousness felt that she has been, it has been violated. Hegel says, 
that violated Verletztes and hostile essence now demanding revenge, dira It replicates on a collective scale the struggle that results from the lack of recognition in the chapter four. The abstract dimension of the struggle between consciousness in the master-slave dialectic has disappeared. It is no longer the confrontation of two isolated subjectivities lost in the middle of nowhere in a purely intellectualized space, but now, in chapter six, struggle between consciousnesses involves communities and institutions. That is, the struggle for recognitions take place in a concrete and complex, complex historical world in which the struggling consciousnesses reveal the contradictory dimension of a social organization. The contradiction inherent in society based on the articulation of human law and divine law consists in the fact that, on one hand, human law needs divine law to exist. Women must, women must give birth and educate young men so that they can leave the private family sphere and enter the public sphere of political deliberation. But on the other hand, women are not given any real recognition and feel oppressed, unterdrückt, by uh, human law. So they risk fighting against it and undermining the very existence of the community. The society described by Hegel is contradictory because it represses what it needs to survive, because it turns what it relies on into a factor of destruction of the social order. This is the very meaning of the famous polity's eternal irony. Hegel says that the polity creates an enemy in the feminine itself. By intrigue, the feminine, the polity's eternal ironies, changes the government's universal purpose into a private purpose. The concept of irony in Hegel has a technical meaning. It designates the negativity not relieved by any positivity, a form of dialectic without synthesis. Hegel, however, distinguishes the modern and romantic irony from the ancient and Greek sense of irony. In his Lessons of the History of Philosophy, he criticizes Friedrich von Schlegel for having made irony the principle of a vain subjectivity which refuses the seriousness of the world. On the contrary, he values Socratic irony as it refers to a rational and objective movement. Irony collapses the oppositions posed by the understanding and indicates the necessity of their overcoming. Socratic irony refers to what in the encyclopedia will be called the dialectical moment, negatively rational, of the logical process. The eternal irony in the phenomenology of spirit must be linked to this ancient and Greek irony and not to, romantic one, to the romantic one. A very similar expression for Socratic irony can be found in the lessons of the history of philosophy, where Hegel speaks of the universal irony of the world, Aigemeine Ironie der Welt. Precisely in chapter six of the phenomenology, this is not only the affirmation of a vain subjectivity, but a subjectivity that reveals an objective movement, as it is the case with Socratic irony. What can be seen through feminine irony is a contradiction inherent in social organization and not a purely subjective vanity devoid of any objective basis. The woman's revolt embodied in the singular figure of Antigone may be guided by a vengeful subjectivity that appears selfish in comparison to the general good of society, but it has objective foundations and reveals something real in the world. The contradiction that consists in the fact that the polity, the Gemeinwesen, oppresses, unterdrückt, a part of itself. So I, I cannot develop here uh, the transition from Greek world to uh, the Roman Empire in the phenomenology, but I just indicate that it is a transition from uh, the struggle to domination. Uh, uh, the, the denial of recognition in the Greek world and the struggle between feminine and masculine principles um, as for, uh, is resulting into the domination uh, of the emperor in uh, uh, the Roman world. But I'm going to, to conclude. The polity is of course, uh, no, I conclude. <laughs> uh, Hegel's text presents a polynomial partition of the community. 
the Greek city is presented as a united community whose functioning makes all individuals participate in the same harmonious society. However, this social unity is only made possible because the community represses a part of itself. The community then reveals within itself the existence of another community, with, whose denial of recognition provokes a vengeful reaction that ruins social unity and produces stasis in the city. The oppressed community constitutes itself as an irony of the community of the people, to which, at the same time, it belongs and does not belong. It is both integrated and excluded. We have seen that for Hegel, this, this division took the form of a struggle between the community of women and the community of men, and it gave the dialectic of domination and servitude the meaning of a conflict, of a conflict between the sexes. From this point of view, Hegel himself offers a gender interpretation of the dialectic, of the master-slave dialectic, that could be updated today for a feminist perspective. It is certain that Hegel was not a feminist in the true sense of the word, but in the phenomenology of spirit. He accorded the conflict between men and women and women's desire for recognition a decisive importance in history. I think that it can be verified by the very end of the section spirit. It is well known that at the end of the chapter on evil and its forgiveness, two consciousnesses, two consciousnesses are reconciled before God and achieve mutual recognition. Uh, this famous quotation, it is the God that appears in the midst of those who know themselves as pure knowing. I propose to read these lines as the description of the reconciliation between male and female consciousness through marriage. The yes that conscious, consciousness is exchanged would be the yes that a husband and a wife exchange before God when they marry. And this would mark the overcoming of the conflict between the sexes in history. This is exactly what the principle of the philosophy of right will explain in 1820. Women find in modern marriage a right to love that was denied in the past. Hegel takes note that in modernity, women at last no longer marry for financial or status reasons, but they marry for love. I believe that for Hegel, this was, for his time, the highest recognition that women could attain. This is precisely what separates us from him. For us, love in marriage is no longer the privileged sphere of recognition for women. It has even become an ideological theme that sometimes serves to increase masculine domination. This is why we need to update the Hegelian theory to include other contemporary forms of recognition for women love outside marriage, lesbian love, but also new form of social, economic, and political recognition for women. In this sense, Antigone's struggle, as described in the phenomenology of spirit, is still our task today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Baptiste, for your effort. Uh, of saving Hegel. We appreciate it. Um, any questions? Uh, Eva? Yeah. Uh, I saw. Uh, I can speak without, no problem. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> ah. Oh. Oh, thank you very much. I very much agree with your interpretation. Actually, I give a very uh, similar interpretation in my. Uh, book on Hegel, and I well, I agree with almost everything. Well, actually, everything you said. I think <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you something, uh, or, or add something, and ask you if you if you would agree. Um, well, first of all, I think that Hegel's concept of the family has, as any concept in Hegel's philosophy, in the real philosophy, um, a history, and so as you uh, try to show. Um, we have to read Hegel's Antigone as uh, um, we, c we cannot just compare and uh, take Antigone for the modern world because it's really part of the history of family and gender relations. And that's very important, I think, because especially in the American debate, I guess, I think that's of, or also, well, in some postmodern readings, that's often 
forgotten, I think. Or it's at least if you want to be understand the Hegelian thinking, then it's really important. Of course, you can take Antigone and do whatever you like, but <laughs> if you want to try to understand Hegel's point with Antigone, you have to see it as a historical stage. Um, and um, uh, actually, Hegel has a history of the family from the Oriental family to the Greek family, to the Roman family, and to the modern family, um, um, what I try to show in my book. And then it becomes even clearer the stage and the reason why Antigone is an important step in the Greek uh, Sittlichkeit. Um, so, but what I wanted to add or uh, to your um, conclusion is the brother-sister relation is still, uh, the, um, the woman has an uh, Ahnung, uh, um, der Anerkennung in this relation, um, but it's still an asexual relation. And that, uh, for Hegel, it's important that with the modern family it's possible um, to have a sexual relationship and at the same time be um, recognized as an individual. And um, you pointed out the importance well, I, I'm not sure if I got the last year conclusion, I th um, but um, um, I think for to understand why this is possible to have um, Anerkennung as an individual in the modern family for Hegel, uh, one has to understand that um, the the concept of the Rechtsperson, the I don't know the the English term. Uh, so the Greek in the Roman world, um, the the Rechtsperson. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the, the concept of of, uh, rechts, of person of, of uh, yeah is uh, developed and um, in love in, in the in, in the marriage um, uh, the man and woman um, meet as before they married marry they they marry they meet as rechtspersonen. And then they give up their status as a rechtsperson and become one person. And uh, that's what Hegel calls love. And that's also very important for, um, for women to be seen as a, like you said, as a particular individual. Um, and um, therefore to be able um, to be um, recognized as uh, an individual, uh, without having to, uh, w um, the without uh, uh, bearing uh, children, because actually, the um, in, uh, according to Hegel, the modern marriage um, isn't based on, uh, it doesn't have the Zweck der der Erzeugung von Kindern anymore. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, I really think that you're right uh, when you. Um, when you see Antigone as part of the history of the family, and that Hegel can actually show that the modern family has um, is is a um, is a progress in, uh, compared to the um, family in Greek ethical life, um, but of course I agree that we cannot stop there. And actually, um, uh, Karl Marx in his Capital says exactly that. Uh, he, he quotes Hegel and says, well, yeah, you can start with the Oriental family and go over to the Greek family and then the Roman and show that the modern family is in some way a progress, but we cannot stop there. Um, and um, he, he actually quotes uh, Hegel in this sense. So the question would be, uh, do you also think that it's important um, for um, the question of recognition that it's actually uh, we are actually able in the modern world not only to to uh, to, to love each other <laughs> and be recognized at the same time but, um, as as women, but um, also to have a sexual relationship and not being just determined by um, the sexual relationship because that's what taints. Uh, the uh, for Hegel, it, it, in, in the Greek world, that's what actually makes it impossible for men and women to um, have um, uh, rec recognition in in their um, relationship. Mm. Yeah, um, so I can react. From, I agree with uh, all you said, but uh, and, and I I I, want, I think that. The, Antigone, the figure of Antigone just um, is a way to, to say that the conflict between the sexes for a girl, it's at the beginning of history, and I totally agree that 
the, uh, the modern issue with family and, and the modern love and the modern uh, recognition between men and women is not inscribed or, um, or um, with the uh, Antigone situation and she's in the past. So, but this is this um, moment of beginning of history and the relationship between men and women uh, are here. Um, for, for love in modernity, so there is several questions. If you follow Carol Patman, she said that, yes, Hegel considers love only as something very abstract, and, but there is affectivity. It's not just uh, the dimension of right. Uh, I agree, there is this dimension of uh, being recognized as a person of right and uh, before the law, before the institution, but there is also the affectivity. So this is one point. The other point is that recognition for women is not only uh, this dimension of love. Uh, you have uh, several forms of love, uh, lesbianity or transgender and uh, different uh, non-heterosexual uh, uh, orientation for love, but you have also what uh, Nancy Fraser uh, pointed out as the redistribution, so the economical and material question that is also at stake. And that is also a part of uh, the recognition for a uh, uh, woman. Uh, and recognition not only between men and women, but between women themselves, so for, with the sorority and, and um, this, um, this topic. So, yes, just some, some reaction to what you say, but uh, thank you. Okay, um, thanks so much. I have a question about the role of decision in your reconstruction of that chapter. And so Hegel has this one passage in the very beginning where he says that nature assigns one sex to one law and the other sex to the other law. And then I think he mentions decision there and says that it was not based on decision. Yeah, and so this, was, this seems important to the kind of internal self-understanding of this form of life, that this was done by nature. And I think part of Hegel's criticism is to say that this is disingenuous because nature cannot assign uh, one sex to one law and the other sex to the other law. So there, was dis there were decisions made that were not acknowledged as such. At least that's how I read um, one of the sort of diagnoses mm -hmm. that, is, that he offers. And so I'm wondering um, how that bears on the question of Antigone's decision um, and so you said that Antigone is not just a puppet for the divine law, she decides to pursue the divine law at the expense of the human law, and in that sense acts knowingly. And would that also hold for Creon? So is there a kind of symmetry there in terms of their decision? Um, and also Creon's decision to enact the human law or to give it this kind of specificity. So I'm wondering whether this, there's a symmetry there in your, on your reading. Um, so for the decision, um, yes, it's a, it's a big polemical question because uh, a lot of commentators, like you say, consider that Antigone has not a choice or there is no decision. But in Hegel's text, he says the enchided the. And, um, uh, what I, I find in, interesting in Pinkard's and Pippin's interpretation of this um, text is that they point out that there is a decision. She, she, cannot, it, it's, she cannot decide to be for the um, political and human law. So she is in the divine law. But you have this, she appropriates and she subjectively chooses for, uh, and she, she poses the law uh, that she cannot choose. So you have this, um, this is the emergence of the individuality in the Greek world, exactly as for Socrates. Um, it's not, a, yes, I think that uh, um, you cannot say that, she, she has no part in the decision for her action. So it's, it's my interpretation. And for Cléon, Hegel says the same thing. Cléon too is involved, involved in his decision. Um, and your question was, what, what does it change? Or what, what, was, what is at stake in, in Cléon's decision for, for the human law? 
No, it was more why sort of emphasize that Antigone is making a decision and, you know, whether that is a point of contrast between her and Cleon or whether the same... Yes, uh, it, it, well. yes, because, yes, because Cleon is on the part of the principle of the good organization and the harmonious organization of the city. But Antigone is experiences the contradiction of the city and what makes the city cannot... Um, <laughs> yes, uh, she's destined to disappear <laughs> for Eger. And it's very strange on a historical point of view because it's absolutely false that the transition from Greek world to uh, Rome <laughs> uh, is based on this contradiction between the feminine principle mm -hmm. and the masculine principle. But I think that the experience of Antigone reveals something contradictory, but not Cleon's decision. Really, really. <laughs> mm. Okay, um, I'm very sympathetic with your you uh, trying to make a feminist uh, uh, out of Hegel, but. I, I have the feeling you distort a little bit some things. I, I, but I want your, your, uh, your uh, reaction to that. And I will say three things. When, when two or three will we get, be gathered in my name, I will be among them. This is love in a Christian way, not in a sexual way. This is not wedding. And I think this is what is about, it is about there, because they are not united in front of God. God appears between them when they say yes. The yes is God, I think. I, this is the way I read it. On the other hand, the second point, you said there are two communities, a male community and a feminine community inside the ancient polis. I have the feeling there is a polis and the oikos, that is the family, which is represented by, by a woman in the conflicts in Sophocles and in other, other uh, uh, especially dramas in ancient times. And Hegel says, um, we had only family and state, and new, only in, the, in new times we have the civil society in between them. So, it is very probable that, and we, we, I could show it with different places in the text, I think, that he is speaking about that, and that he is, in a way, put it on a stage by using Sophocles and Antigone with the two personas of a man and a wife and a woman. But it's not as if there were in a, a, a feminine society oppressed by uh, I think, by a male society. It's two ways of being together. There's a big problem. Uh, most of the tragedies are about that. I mean, Orestes kills his father, but he has to kill his father. Uh, he kills his mother, excuse me. But it's not, it's not his mother. It's the, it's the, the murder of, of, of his father and, and the murder of the, the chief of the state. So he has two things in it's himself. He has the oikos and he has the polis together. And that's, that's a bad bad thing to have. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Crayon has, has the same problem. It's his daughter-in-law, and uh, it, uh, Antigone is his daughter-in-law, and it is the one he should punish. So it, th there is always this problem between these two, and they have the feeling that you cannot just say it's a, a thing between a woman and, I mean, he, it's just a paradigm, I, I would say. And the third thing, I have the feeling that the master-slave relationship has a difference. As, uh, there's a difference between this thing and uh, woman and man. Because, I mean, in the master-slave uh, opposition, the two self-consciousness try to kill each other, okay? Which I don't think Hegel says anywhere that uh, men try to kill women or the other way around. And women are supposed to submit freely. That's the idea. The, the slave does not submit freely. He submits because he is afraid of getting killed, I think. And, I mean, there are two different things. Human bondage is one thing, and the other thing is woman oppression. Uh, uh, when we see in details, Hegel says uh, that this romantic thing about being in love with one's husband is not the best thing to do. The best thing is to, to have a marriage uh, uh, has, uh, 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 
arranger. <laughs> I, I, so I wouldn't say that Hegel would have in mind such feminist things. I'm, I'm, I'm not very glad about it, but I think, well, if we want to say what, to, to understand what he's saying, that he would at the same time say that to be in love is not the best thing to, to do when you want to marry. I mean, <laughs> so what is your okay, okay. reaction to this? I mean, yes, maybe classical uh, objections. So, four questions. Um, uh, for the yes before God, uh, of course it's, uh, uh, at the end of the section, spirit. Of course, it's a little bit provocative. So, uh, at the end of evil and forgiveness, I, I agree that it's a little bit provocative. But, if you agree that the conflict between sexes at, at the beginning of history in section spirit, at the end, you have this yes between two, two consciousness before God. And even if it's a little bit provocative, I think that it can be one meaning of this passage. They have passivity, the schöne Seele has something feminine, maybe. But, well. Okay, so, but uh, it's just one interpretation of that. It's not the, the whole meaning, okay. For, uh, you say there is no oppression of women, it's just some, the feminine is a model or paradigm and so on. It's exactly the Judith Butler argument in, uh, in his text on, uh, on uh, Antigone. But I think that Hegel is very interested in uh, the condition of women in history. And as Eva said, he, he distinguishes uh, the family and the role of women in different form of institution among history. Uh, when he deals with Egypt in the philosophy of history, he says women are working in Egypt, and he says it's a progress of spirit. What is strange is that in the philosophy of right, it doesn't speak about the working, uh, uh, the women that are working, and so on. But uh, uh, he doesn't want to, to to put away the question of the oppression of women in uh, history. So I think that it's not just the feminine. I, like a paradigm or model or some logical meaning and not the concrete women that are unterdrückt uh, in, their, uh, in Hegel's text, but I think that they are real women and not just the feminine principle. For the master self dialectic, today I just say that it is exactly the same structure, structure between you have recognition, struggle and domination. And in the Greek world you have recognition there is a failure, there is a struggle, and then the transition to Roman world is the domination with the emperor. It's exactly the same structure of the chapter. And I think that Hegel wants to put the master slave dialectic on a historical and social level. I'm not saying that, so I, I say it in, on, <laughs> in other texts, but not today. <laughs> but uh, today I was not saying that uh, the slave is the woman in the chapter four. And for uh, uh, love and what Hegel means by love, um, like, yeah, I say to Eva that Karl Patman said what you say, it's, it's not love in the affective meaning and so on, but um, in uh, his lessons on aesthetic and philosophy of art, uh, when he deals with romanticism and Christian love, he said that affectivity and real uh, uh, the love in the common sense, and not just love as an abstract principle and so on, uh, uh, must count, must be uh, in part of this concept of love. So I don't agree that it's not the affective dimension of love. It is a part of it. Um, thank you very much. Um, this was very interesting. Um, a lot of my questions were already answered in the debate, so I'll just stick to one simple thing, uh, which is the irony. Um, the irony is, uh, I, I, I completely want to agree with you, uh, and I, I mean, on the part that it's not Schlegel's irony, I think that's very clear and obvious, but I wonder if you can save Hegel here by saying that that's Socratic irony, that he's actually uh, you know, showing that there's a kind of a teaching moment for us in a way if we, if we pursue. Um, simply, you know, 
rereading the full the full paragraph is is very hard to 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 say that this is a, a Socratic argument. Let, let me let me read this. Diese die Weiblichkeit, die ewige Ironie des Gemeinwesens, verändert durch die durch die Intrige den allgemeinen Zweck der Regierung in einen Privatzweck. It's it's really not flattering to Hegel. Uh, verwandelt uh, also verwandelt ihre allgemeine Tätigkeit in ein Werk. Um, dieses bestimmten Individuums und Verkehr das allgemeine Eigentum des Staats zu einem Besitz und Putz der Familie. It's really, really hard to say that Hegel is progressive here or that uh, he somehow uh, shows us that um, in a way the problem is precisely because, uh, you know, uh, the woman is unterdrückt. And I wonder, so I wonder if you think that maybe uh, Karin de Boer has a point uh, when she argues that maybe uh, this whole this whole paragraph, this whole section, isn't isn't anymore about the tragedy. Uh, that is maybe about the comedy. It's maybe already a, a question of Hellenismus, uh, of the you know of Aristoph uh, Aristophanes, basically. Um, and you know, one argument in favor would be that the only other. Um, moment in Phenomenologie Geistes where Hegel uses the word ironie is when he discusses comedy uh, later on in, uh, in, uh, in Phenomenologie. So I wonder what you make of her argument, that this is maybe not at all Antigone, that maybe it's not tragedy at all, maybe it's about comedy. Okay, thank you. For comedy, tragedy, um, uh, I have, I have, actually, I, I have no idea. But for this, uh, um, I think that it, if you want, it's it's some kind of mixtures of of mixture between uh, the Socrates irony and the romantic or vain subjectivity irony, because of course Antigone, or if it's not Antigone, or the the woman's revolt that uh, turns the government into intrigue and private sphere. Uh, I think that Hegel is not interested in the purity of the principle, of the motives of the action. So she, it's just some kind of reaction to domination, just kind of a vengeful. So uh, there are dark and impure motivations. But I think that it doesn't interest Hegel what is the motivation. What is important is that it reveals something objectively contradict contradictory in the world. And in this sense, this is also not just a vain subjectivity, so Schlegel's and, and um, romantic irony, but it is also the Greek and ancient meaning of irony in this objective dimension. So I agree that there is the two part of it, maybe, because the motives are impure. But there is this objective dimension that is not modern, not romantic. Um. Um, thank you. Uh, I would like to. Thank you. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Uh, I would like to come back to this uh, recognition through brothers and sisters, because as far as I understand, Hegel um, reads it as a, such a pure recognition that has no sexual desire in it. Mm -hmm. But the point is that we are talking about Antigone, the daughter of an incest, <laughs> of Oedipo and Jocasta, and she carries something like a curse. She is cursed through this uh, incest, and um, yeah, there is uh, this section of the play, I don't remember exactly where, but I can look after and tell you, um, where Antigone refers to her brother as having a philia. That means she loves him. It can be read as a friendship love, as a brother and sister love, but also in a sexual desire uh, meaning. That is not weird because she is a daughter of an incest. It's kind of natural that she <laughs> is incestual, too. So uh, she may be having this desire for his brother, and Hegel uh, is just simply denying it. 
she, he's not reading in this way. But there is this problem. This uh, Antigone is a ambiguous figure. She is a subversive in all ways we can think, and also in this way. So um, I don't know. Uh, this is important role in the whole play, and Hegel doesn't talk about it anywhere. <laughs> so I don't know. What what do you think about it? How can recognition works with this ancestral or cursed <laughs> way? Uh, so I I just can repeat to Judith Butler's argument that this incestuous and this love for his brother, if you want to say something positive or some kind of, of emancipatory dimension to it, it's the disintegration of kinship, in, of traditional kinship. And Butler says, uh, in the incest, you have this destruction of patriarchy and so on. But Yes, I just can repeat this argument if I want to, to, to say something about but it's not the yes, it, it's not the path I I follow. But but you have an idea about this incestuous relation or it No, I think that Hegel's just leave it as okay, okay. it's there, it's in the play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It might be read like that. And that's interesting because mm. well Okay. Short follow-up. Yes, if I may, as a representative of Greece, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think in ancient Greek there is no uh, collective term for love. There are three terms: philia, agape, and eros. Eros is sexual love. The other two are not, I think, sexual love. In my opinion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is on. Thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I would like to go back to the question of Andrea, the one about the decision and the fact that Antigone was not just a puppet. And um, uh, I can see that it is a really tricky, tricky moment to understand in which way they, they decide, she and Creon decide. And I think that uh, there is maybe a passage that I don't know if it, it gives a solution or, or gives a or makes things uh, more complicated from the from uh, the um, writings on art on, of Hegel, where he writes that the greatness of Creon and Antigone is in their pathos. This is in the fact that they are that they do what they are. And uh, so I think that maybe this could be a passage that can help us. Uh, to, I don't know if uh, to <laughs> create more problem and more uh, doubts uh, about uh, this idea of decision uh, in this, but for sure uh, that can uh, indicate us a way where to go. Because uh, these things about they are, they do what they are, it's uh, something that has inside, that imply that they are not just puppets, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, the first. Do you mm. want me to, to ask you, or because I have three things to ask yeah, you. Yes, yes, sir. The second one is that you made the parallelism between uh, the master-slave and, and the uh, recognition between uh, women, women and men, if I understood right. And um, I don't know if uh, some uh, feminists would agree on this. Uh, I'm thinking about Carla Lonzi, for example, was the first one that says that the problem of the master-slave uh, relation is that the recognition was always about two entities, two entities that are already male. And so uh, something that cannot be used as a parallelism for uh, uh, the relationship that comes after in the uh, recognition between men and women. So this is my second question. Mm -hmm. Even if I find your suggestion really um, strong, and uh, the third is more uh, uh, an idea, a suggestion, because you talked about other forms of love. And uh, I was thinking, why not about uh, the love, uh, talking of being into feminism, talking not just about um, lesbian love, or, um, but even simply the mother-daughter relationships or the sisters' relationships, since we're talking about uh, um, Antigone, and even, I don't know, um, 
an attention to the relationship between Antigone and Ismene, for example. That's all. Sorry okay. for okay. if no, I was no, no, long. No. Thank you. Um, for your first question, um, uh, I think that Hegel said that you become an individual in the affective experience. And often, this is a, a tragic and negative experience. Exactly. So, uh, Stravko yesterday said that uh, uh, the slave um, has their mood, uh, the courage, um, because he's facing some negative experience, the experience of death uh, for the slave. And Hegel has this idea that you become an individual that can take decision uh, when there is this reminder. Uh, interior reminder of some 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 affective experience and some uh, the pathos in the in the Greek uh, uh, meaning uh, of the term. It's not just a rational decision, but it's something that is encoded in an affective and negative uh, experience. So I just can say that for Lonzi, uh, of course. The, the thematic of recognition uh, <laughs> is very disputed and polemical in, in a feminist uh, uh, in, in feminism. Even in Simone de Beauvoir, she says that we can take this thematic from Hegel, but it doesn't it doesn't fit for uh, feminist thinking and so on. Um, or in Nancy Fraser, she says there is recognition, but also redistribution and so on. Um, just for Lonzi, it's very strange because she crit she is criticizing master-slave dialectic, and I think that she is criticizing Alexandre Kojev's interpretation, but also this uh, communist party and uh, communism for his time, with this uh, very patriarchal and masculine uh, appropriation of the master-slave dialectic. Women must be recognized by men and. Uh, and, uh, and this is a secondary uh, struggle after the proletarian revolution and so on. But in his text, Lonzi uh, uh, takes the figure of Antigone and she uses exactly this uh, Hegel text on Antigone to say you have to have this revolt of women and young men against patriarchy, against uh, the heads of the family, the father. And, uh, so I think that Lonzi, at the end, proposes a very similar reading of the text that I'm proposing. Uh, for you, your third question is the question: so What kind of love? Okay. Alternative love. Yes. So I I just mentioned lesbian love or love without marriage and so on. So I think that in a, in a lot of feminist thinking, you, you have different kind of love. I mentioned sorority or between mother and daughter. And so, so I think that it, it can be a way for feminist thinking to, to take the recognition and to, to give a positive and uh, emancipatory meaning to recognition. And I don't have a precise idea of what kind of love, because it's in the feminist struggle. <laughs> Working? Hi. Yeah, now, right? OK, um, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. So my question is actually kind of Andrea's question on decision. But I think that my argument is a little bit different. But it's, it's very related. So if you feel that you will give exactly the same answer, then, I mean, it's, it's fine. But it, yeah, and of course, it's on the issue of decision in Antigone. So um, I understand that there is a moment of decision um, since Antigone is choosing to confront the laws of the police or of the city in order to fulfill the laws of the divine and so on. The thing, I mean, my, my main concern is that it is a still a tragedy. So it is the, 
I mean, the destiny is settled, it's determined. I mean, this is what in tragedies happened, that all the, decision, I mean, all the decisions of the main characters are apparent, in the sense that they think that they are changing the course of the facts, but they are really not doing it. So, in this sense, I, I understand that the decision that Antigone is making can be interpreted as this decision was already being determined by, the fate, by her fate, which is written by gods and so on. So, yeah, this is basically my question. And also because I think that in Hegel, I mean, it depends on how you understand of Hegel. You can, you can see that modern subject that freely decides is already like starting to be cooked in Antigonus' figure, but it will not be explicit until Napoleon and other figures. So it's not like an effective decision or a backlash decision, but only like it's just the first seed that of its potentiality. So in this sense, I don't see exactly, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you understood my yeah, point, yeah. I guess, so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think that for, of course, uh, individuality and world decision is proper to modern society or modern world. But I, I, I think that for Hegel, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, um, had a sense of individuality. It's just that they didn't have the institution to make it concrete and effective in society. And uh, for Hegel, it's, particular, it's, it's clear when he deals with Socrates, but I think it's the same thing with uh, Antigone. And in his lessons on religion and philosophy of art, and even in philosophy of history, he said that the Greek had a sense of individuality, but they didn't have the institutions to make it real. And modernity, what is specific to modernity, is the invention of institution in right, in civil society, to make this individuality a world or a, a, a concrete world. So I don't think that the, the Greek people didn't have this uh, uh, singular individuality. I think that they didn't have the institution for it. It's my, uh, my reading of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will now say, are there, I won't now say, are there any other questions? Because uh, I think we will be able to continue on Antigone uh, with our next talk. I will just uh, thank you very thank much you. to Jean-Baptiste.